Good evening, everybody. I am really thrilled. And despite the everything that's happening all over the world, that we get an opportunity this evening together on Africa Day and just celebrate all that we are, all that we're working to be, and what a great panel we have for you this evening. From wherever you are joining us, I hope today you've had some time to just stop, reflect, think about what it means that we stop all over the world and celebrate the achievements of African people. Today, we'll be talking education with a panel that comes from right across global Africa. And just as we get into the beginning, let me um, remind you that this is the Pan-African Forums. We meet every month on the last Tuesday of the month. And this is the eighth conversation that we have been having. For those of you joining us on YouTube over the live stream, if you have any questions or comments, just drop them in the comment section and we'll be sure to come to them. And for those of you who are joining us on, the, on Zoom, feel free to put all your comments as we go along, but specifically take your questions and drop them into the Q&A so that when we come to the discussion, we will start with that. Today, as we reflect on Africa Day, we're thinking about how Pan-Africanism has reproduced itself, how it's evolved both theoretically and historically in different spaces through time. We've been thinking about how all over global Africa, we have been educating ourselves. We'll be reaching back into the past, but also reaching out into the, into the future. And let me just go straight and invite you to join our, our panel as I recognize the presence of our hosts, The Elephant, Alliance Frances, and Ifra Nairobi, thank you again for giving us this space. My name is Mishai Mwangola, and it is such a joy to be joined by Wandia Njoya, Jennifer Tosh, and Lewis Gordon. Wandia, let me come to you first, for those who haven't had a wonderful chance to meet you. Wandia is Senior Lecturer in the Department of Language and Performing um, Arts at Desta University. Um, she says that social media is my classroom. One day you said this to me a couple of years ago and so many things fell into place. And indeed, I think you are known as somebody who is educating a whole new generation, both through um, your blog, which won the blog Bloggers Association of Kenya's Best Social Issues and Active Citizenship blog from when it was introduced in, in 2017, all the way until 2019. And I believe they've suspended the awards during the pandemic season. So you will go down in history as having held it for I think five years. And then you also now have begun during this pandemic season, a vlog, Maisha Kazini. And in it, you focus very specifically on mind and soul. Do, just tell us a little bit more. Why, why is social media so important to you? Why have you chosen to go virtual, even though you do have a classroom, you teach at the university, you've already got so many students? What's that about? Karibu Wandia. Santi. Um, I, I found that I had to go to social media because of the constraints of the institutions. Um, and maybe that's something we might talk about. It's very difficult to innovate in the current curriculum. It's very difficult to teach what one would like to teach. So I said, let me teach it on the, the digital platform because there are probably people who would learn and it's easier for them to learn because there's no exam. You know, when, once you're in the school system, there's also the pressure of exams. So, you know, teaching on social media is better because people come to learn because they want to. And why did you decide? I know you do a lot on Facebook, you do a lot on Twitter, then you had a blog. Why did you decide now to go on video? Um, actually, it started with, uh, I, I, I felt that I was not getting hard, especially when I was talking about education. I was not getting hard by the parents and I thought uh, video, you know, people can just put it uh, to play while they are driving or while they are doing other activities. So I wanted the audio part of, 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 the, of the, the conversation. And then when the pandemic came, I realized that uh, I can also put some of my classes uh, on because I was recording as I was teaching. So I realized I could put my classes online. 
And you call your vlog Maisha Kazini, which means? Uh, life, life and work, life at work. Yeah, all those. I wanted to talk about the intersection between work, life, and education, because I felt that there's an artificial barrier and you know, artificial schisms between uh, work and life and work and education. And I also felt that part of our problem with education was our misconceptions of work. So that's why I decided to do two strands, one on work um, or, you know, not really employment, but work and the other strand on education. And indeed, one of my favorite series on the vlog is when you talk about mind and soul and you've just talked about schisms. And I think one of the things you always emphasize is that you just don't educate a mind and remove it from the body, the soul, and the spirit. And so we really look forward to seeing what you have to say to us, especially when we think about education in the same breath as Pan-Africanism. One, day I, one thing I found, and I'm going to come to all the panel and ask exactly the same question. This, just all of you are so invested in the arts. And, and for you, I think of you particularly in terms of literature, but one thing I really love about you is it's not just about you know, saying I'm a writer. You've really invested in nurturing both writers as well as readers. Have I got you wrong on that? That that's really close to your heart? Yes, uh, writing is very close to my heart, but most of all creativity. Um, for me, writing is where we create ideas. So that's why I'm very invested in, in, in writing. But I've tried to do also, I pushed very hard for music at some point. So um, I, I, I have tried to be uh, diverse when it comes to pushing for the arts. Well, I'm sure we'll come to the arts just given who the panelists are. Thank you very much, Wandia. You're very welcome. And speaking of musicians, music and musicians, we have a musician who's right here in the space with us. I am tempted to be the first person probably who will say that. Um, Lewis Gordon is a musician who is also a philosopher. I think the other, usually it comes the other way. I'm sure for many people who are joining us, he needs no introduction. Um, he is professor and head of philosophy at the University of, okay, I'm going to totally embarrass myself because now I've got a thing about saying Connecticut stores. But I think, Lewis, you are known as a philosopher of an entire generation and perhaps right across global Africa. People know you, they read you, they love your work. The other thing that strikes me about you, Lewis, is that I've never found somebody who is honorary president or a member of so many different associations and groups of thinkers right across the world. So for example, you're honorary president of the Global Center for Advanced Studies in Ireland. You're also honorary professor of the Unit for the Humanities at Rhodes University, Uhuru, in South Africa. And you're chairperson of the awards committee of the Caribbean Philosophical Association. You are truly somebody who everybody would say that person is a public intellectual. And then of course, many of us know your work um, from your work on Fanon to your work in terms of thinking about disciplines to your work as a philosopher of physics. You just have been thinking a lot about so many things. Karibu. Um, Professor ah, Gordon. Yes, a jambo to everybody. Everybody, I'm delighted to be here and happy, happy Africa Day to all. I must say that I was just um, catching up with um, some of your work and it, it's, I smiled again. I remember smiling when I first heard you um, speak about your book, What Fanon Said. And you were speaking in the US, but then you said, I've just come from Nairobi. And it was the way that you were able to just, you know, just even as you were speaking, bring the experiences of so many different spaces into that one room that really, really um, stayed in my mind. And as I was, I went back to look for that because it's always been one of my favorite, seeing you in conversation and talking about how even the space that you are becomes sacred space just because you're there and you're doing the work that you do as a thinker. So I wonder if you would just talk to us a little bit about some of your work, some of your, the texts that you think um, people might be ab absolutely interested in engaging in relation to this talk. Well, thank you. Thank you for bringing up that point about sacred space, because yes, it's true. I never speak with my shoes on. 
And in fact, when I was in that rooftop in Nairobi, uh, the rooftop of the YMCA, folks noticed that you put your, you take off your shoes in the presence of the ancestors. And as we know, one of the things I mentioned is if we do not understand the value of ancestors, then we are also rejecting the value of descendants. And you could see what is happening to our planet when it's inherited by people who take, have no fidelity or respect to honor commitments to the past or to the future. They jeopardize life on this planet. My work is about reality. But reality, as we know, is greater than the question of whether we can control or hold things. Reality is always that which reminds us of our humility because it's always greater than us. And it's something that many of our ancestors understood very well. In fact, a lot of my work is about not only the question of freedom, liberation, human dignity, but it's also the question of understanding what it is not to close ourselves off from reality, to imagine ourselves as gods, but to embrace, to decreate, to understand what it is to reach out socially to the world around us. So there's many, there are many things I could say, but of course, connected more immediately to Africa Day. Look, you can't talk about Africa without talking about liberation because we're talking about the imposition, not only on African peoples all across the globe, but many forget, many forget that just, you know, about eight or 10,000 years ago, all humanity, as we understood, understand humanity, was in the way that we think of today, Africans. And so one of the things we have to bear in mind is that something horrible has happened to humanity when it tried to erase its relationship to its birthplace. Mm. This effort, in other words, all who are looking, listening to this conversation, look at this right now, remember this, colonialism, racism are lies. And part of that lie, right? Because when you think about lies, lies are all used to manipulate, to hide, right? To conceal, to make us forget. And part of Africa Day is to remember, to be connected. And that means to embrace truth. And part of the lie is to make us think that there's anything about Africa about which we should be ashamed. We should be proud, we should love, we should embrace the birthplace of humanity. And we should understand that there is so much, so much for us to do to reclaim what it is for humanity not to hide from itself, but to support its continued growth, flourishing, and have that done not through profit and rapacious notions of wealth, but through the wealth of love, kindness, and the embracing of the heart. That is so true. And indeed, in, in the work that you've been doing, I know your latest book, um, and you know, you talked about, we cannot talk about Africa, they had not talk about liberation. And your latest book indeed talks about freedom, justice, and decolonization. And then I know you've got a forthcoming book, and I wonder if you just wanted to say a little bit more about what that might be before sure. I just go back to something you just said that I absolutely want to carry with me through the conversation. Sure, thank you. You know, I'm often asked, why don't I uh, promote my books? And there are two reasons, um, well, three reasons. One is uh, there are quite a number of them. The mm -hmm. second reason is that sometimes when people are talking a lot about their books, they don't pay attention to each other. And I'd rather people often go back afterwards because we connect in real time with each other. But since you asked more immediately, yes, I wrote a book recently called Freedom, Justice, and Decolonization. In fact, What's funny is why I'm showing this one is my daughter, Sula Gordon. She is right. Her name Sula is it's a Zulu name. She designed the cover and the book is dedicated to my two grandmothers. And at the time, I didn't realize how she symbolically had the two grandmothers. And the um, and there's a lot I could say about that book. But actually, when we come to talk about Africa Day, I could also talk about mothers in a, in, when we, we return there. But the other book you're asking about is a book called Fear of Black Consciousness. And that's a book that's uh, coming out at the end of this year. 
by Penguin and uh, Ferrao Strauss Giro. It's coming out in German and um, Portuguese and a few other languages. And I'm hoping that it could also come out in the continent in some of the varieties of local languages. But fear of black consciousness, very quickly, very quickly from what I just said, uh, you could probably already guess what it's about. The, you know, there's a, the world is afraid of black people being conscious because of black people being conscious, you know what that is? Truth. And one of the truths that a lot of people are afraid of is this is the importance of political action. So fear of co black consciousness is fear of truth, fear of reality, and fear of political action. And I explore that fear and fight in my words in defense of, of it. So ultimately, there's a lot that's in there, but yeah, that book is called Fear of Black Consciousness. Thank you so much. And what we'll be doing is sharing some links as we go along in the conversation in the chat on some of these books. I also should say that one thing I really do appreciate about you is that you do make a lot of your work freely available. And so we will um, put some links to some of the um, where we, people can just go online and, and look you up, but also to the journal Philosophy and Global Affairs, which I think you, know, you made sure that would be able to be have open access so that people could come into this space of engaging philosophically around the issues of global Africa. And Absolutely. Then Absolutely. When, when, when we created the journal, we just insisted, no. What's the point of saying global affairs if we don't make it available for free to the people? So yeah, it's, it's a journal that's available to the people and it's very easy to access. Thank you so much for that. And then the third person on the panel is really invested in making sure that all this intellectual work, particularly history, which you talked about earlier, is freely, it's available, people can come across it, people can begin to be aware of it all around where they are. We spoke a little bit about the importance of history already and, our, and the, the idea of the past being present with us and the importance of making sure that what our ancestors did and the lives that they lived are not forgotten where we are today. So it is such a pleasure, Jennifer, I've had so much about your work, to welcome Jennifer Tosh. Jennifer is a cultural historian and a sociologist. She is founder and CEO of Black Heritage Tours that are both in Amsterdam and in New York. And it was so great when we were talking earlier to know that um, um, Levis Gordon has actually knows about that and has experienced that. She's also co-founder of the Sites of Memory Foundation. And Jennifer's done quite a bit of writing so that um, she does the tours, she teaches people in this in public space um, but then she's also written about it and we'll come to a little bit about that. Jennifer, the most favorite thing of all the things that I found that you said about yourself is that you are a time traveler and an edupreneur. And I was like, okay, I don't think I've ever interviewed a time traveler in my life. So what do you mean by those two terms? Um, describing yourself as a time traveler and also describing yourself as an edupreneur. Well, thank you so much, first of all, for having me. I'm really honored to be on this panel. It's such a distinguished. I could just sit and listen to all of you speak and, and truly uh, just learn from the encounter. Um, well, it's interesting because I, I came up with this idea of edupreneur because I've, I've, I don't really fit in one category. You know, I mean, I really am aspiring to be an academic. When I grow up, I, I can only hope to be like uh, Wendy and, and Lewis. I'm also uh, have a business. I, I, I started the Black Heritage Tours in Amsterdam in 2013. And at the same time, I'm, I'm a student of history. So it just seemed like a hybrid that fit all these different categories. And I'm more proud of the idea of being a time traveler because for me, my, in my work, I travel back and forth through time. I'm, I'm always looking at the past through the lens of the present, but also through the diaspora of the past and trying to recover and retrieve the hidden stories, the hidden histories, trying to make them more visible uh, in, in, in public space. So my classroom is the city. The city in the sense is the archive. Um, what makes I think Amsterdam and the Netherlands quite interesting as a, as a space, as a public space, is that everything is so well preserved from this colonial uh, memories. And I'm very focused also on, on heritage and memory. So for me, all these uh, things come together. My work is also, as you said, I love that the thought that my work is my reality. 
And um, yeah, and I am very much connected to the ancestral spirits and ancestral uh, memories that I'm also trying to recover from, uh, from I think the way that the discourse is always focused so much on Europe and the, the European gaze. And we are decentralizing that and trying to centralize uh, what are the voices that want to speak that are that are speaking to us from from the past? And that's really, um, I think it encapsulates what I do. You know, you just talked about this idea and, you know, Lois brought it in of sacred space. And one of the things I find so touching about your work is you make every space sacred. Right, you, we know we don't think of streets as places that there's anything sacred about it, and you've got this ability to take people into the city, into the streets, and make them see things in a way that they will never again not go through those spaces and not see it as sacred spaces that remind us of our bodies, of our histories. I don't want to go too much into that because I know you're going to speak to that. But I do also just want to bring um, something I find amazing. One, as you said, you are a student, but you're not waiting to finish studying before you start putting um, what you're learning into, into the world. But also that your work stretches from the Caribbean stretches into um, North America, into Europe, connects it to um, Africa. And so giving us really not only the space of traveling, the idea of traveling through time, but also traveling through space. And I'm just awed at the way you stretch like that. And then also stretch in terms of you're able to write and you know publish, but you're also able to create these amazing artworks. Just tell me a little bit about that. I know we're gonna you're just about to get into a little bit more about that, but if you oh. could just say it, touch on it where is that? Great. <laughs> yeah, no, it's um, I think uh, for well, I think it's important people know that my my heritage is my family's from Suriname, South America. My ancestors I've traced to the first generation it's as far back as I could go in Suriname. And for those of you who don't know, Suriname was a former colony of the, the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Um, and I was born myself in the United States. So I'm the first generation born in the US. And I've also got course roots in, in the continent of Africa. So for me, this trifecta of, of, of uh, heritage is all very much connected as well. My work in this uh, space really emerged from my, my quest to deepen my understanding of my ancestral line and my family uh, history. And so it's very personal for me. It's, it's, it is, I'm always uh, in contact with the spiritual the dimension as well, because a lot of what, what makes, I think again, the Netherlands particularly unique is there are so many symbols in the built heritage, in the monuments, canal houses, in the archives and museums that, that have been sort of forgotten or maybe people just don't know what do these symbols mean and trying to, reframe this narrative that is so much focused on this idea that African history began with slavery, which we know it did not, and decentralizing that narrative, um, dismantling these structures and how do they impact us today. So that's very much intertwined with what's happening in the world today, but by looking at it through the lens of the past. Mm. And art, you asked me about art, and for me, I also feel like I, as, I too as an artist, I, I I had a 20 year career as a dancer, which most people don't know. And um, I use art as a, as a medium for, tr for communicating um, this history and how do we use the performing arts. So theater, spoken word, um, music, uh, visual arts to tell these stories and to amplify these histories that have been for so long unknown. And that's what I love about art is that we can go beyond the edge, we can push the boundaries because we have the space that artists often are given permission to, to, um, to expand into to tell these, these sometimes very difficult stories for people to hear. You know, that would just, I can't imagine a better way of us to start the conversation by actually then invoking that space of art and, and indeed seeing how art comes into a space to catalyze off a discussion. So we're going to just um, share a tiny little taste of that. Actually, before you do, I do want to sort of set it up a little bit if you're gonna share the video, is that what you're gonna do? Let me, just, let me just share some of the questions we'll be thinking about and then I'll come to you and then you can set it up and we'll go straight into it. And so everybody, you can see what a great panel we have lined up and already we're into the conversation. This was not just introduction. It was giving you a taste of the way we're going to be engaging issues. 
some of the questions that have come to you to ask from you. And, and so I want to honor that and thank everybody who's been in conversation with us over the last seven months. You've wondered what does it mean to educate with the vision of Pan-Africanism in mind? Um, questioned what models may have existed in the past and what models can exist today for educating for the Pan-Africanism. And we're going to ask our panelists to share any, any examples they've found particularly inspiring. Is there a place for integrating Pan-Africanism into the formal education system? And if so, why and where and how? Or are there better ways outside these systems? I think we're already beginning to answer that question. Are there or should there be a canon or some set of basic principles or people everybody has read or any other way of undergirding um, any programs on Pan-Africanism so that we're all speaking the same language and engaging the same concepts? What are some of the challenges facing educators when it comes to um, doing a program of Pan-Africanism in different spaces? And finally, what is the historical challenge of this moment when it comes to the question of education in relation to Pan-Africanism. We are going to go and give each of the panelists 10 to 15 minutes just to share with us their thoughts. And let me start with Jennifer. Jennifer, let us know what you want, what, what we should be looking for, and then we'll run the trailer. Wow, um, that's a lot to try to- <laughs> <your own. laughs> I'm not gonna try to answer all of those at once, but they're very important questions. And I think um, I'm use, I'll use the context in which I, I, I live and, and work because here in the Netherlands, um, there is a Pan-African movement. There is definitely, uh, I think a, a strong history of activism and liberation movements here. It is just, I think in the last 10 years really being amplified and, and becoming much more global, visibly visible globally where people see that the Netherlands has a very strong black and national movement. And one of the things I think for me, what inspired me in my work is when I came here as a student uh, over eight years ago, I'm studying an international student studying from university at California at Berkeley. And I was really, really just dis struck by how much the discourse was so much focused on this idea what they refer to here as the golden age. So the Dutch golden age is emphasizes the rise of the Dutch empire and capitalism and being the first in, of, in terms of trade and uh, maritime heritage. And well, I knew a lot already from my, my studies at, in California at university there and from attending Black Europe summer school that there was no mention about the early black presence, very little uh, emphasis on how the Dutch became one of the 10 richest countries in that uh, in, it was only possible by waging war on indigenous lands. And of course that meant in Africa and in the East Indies and the Caribbean, et cetera. Um, and with so much emphasis as, as if they were self-congratulating about how they achieved all this on their own and completely historically distancing themselves from any black presence in the metropole before uh, the independence of Suriname and the former colonies. So as a, a descendant of this history, I was really pushing back against that and asking the question, well, why are we not also talking about this um, black presence, this African heritage that, that helped build the empire? And I, the professors were somewhat unaware. They were like, oh, well, there was none. It was a lot of this against distancing. There was slavery was denied. There was no black history before the 1970s. And I knew that wasn't true. So that's what really spawned me to go deeper into my own research to find the traces of this hidden history and to use the, the, the built heritage around me as the archive to explore how these symbols represent what was there and what still remains. So it was very interesting because in the educational system, Pan-Africanism, or you could go on, I mean, critical race theory, none of this is central or compulsory. And there is a Dutch canon. And in the Dutch canon, um, yeah, there, up until last year, which just recently added one person of African descent to the canon, it just as, is as if it didn't exist. So I think that your point about should there be a, a Pan-African canon or a canon, I think there probably already is. There's certainly a long legacy of traditions from around the world uh, who are, the, I think, the trailblazers in Pan-African studies and, and um, history. So I think there's just so much to, to learn from that. And then I started the foundation 
which uh, setting up the trailer that you're gonna watch called Sites of Memory uh, with my colleague, Katie Strake. She's a theater maker. I, as a cultural historian, brought these two disciplines together. And again, looking at how can we reframe this very dominant narrative around um, African um, pride and nationalism, language challenging this, uh, this very centralized frame around Europe and focusing more on those forgotten or unknown stories. And that's what the Sites of Memory, it's a theatrical production of the narrative that comes from the three books that I've co-written um, with my colleagues here in, in the Netherlands. And yeah, we, we work together collaborating with people from the continent. So in South, this year we're focusing on Cape Town, which was also a former colony of the Netherlands and, and, um, and trying to bring these histories together and create a, a, yeah, a performance-based um, history theater that talks about also, how do we imagine what the conversations or what the, the experience, the lived experience of people who would have been a part of the system colonized by, but also free. So there's, there's narratives also about the freedom and how the freedom seekers and the self-emancipated operated within this very dominant white society. And so that's, uh, that's what Sites of Memory is. And what I thought would be interesting is to share the trailer for this year with you, and it will show Again, time traveling in terms of time and space. You'll see symbols of places in Cape Town and you also see us kind of traversing back and forth uh, in the story. So it's just a one minute trailer just to share what it will, the sense of what it will be like. Okay, thank you very much. And so here's the trailer. And there you have it. <laughs> Much of love technology. I could share it if it's not if it's not showing up, if it's not easy to. Um... Oh, I think why don't you do why don't you... No more silence. No more silence. Our voices in our tears. Receiving and not knowing. The transparent is a comfort. Our bodies hold stories that want to be told. We are exactly where need be. Collecting the elements of change. If your glory is connected to violence, do not repeat. Our voices, transparent in our tears, seeking transformation to set us free. So as you can see, I become also an embodiment of a griot, the spirit that has been summoned from the past to, to, to invoke this, these, these voices of remembrance and to also to lay them to rest. Um, and that's one of the most exciting parts of doing this is I get to also embody also this, uh, this very important symbol of African, uh, I think, pride and liberation. And I am the one who is taking this journey with this public that is, that is just joining us uh, to these sites of memory where we are reinterpreting, re reimagining this experience, this lived experiences of the diaspora. I just very briefly, I um, love that imagery of unveiling and through dance, the, the point of movement. Thank you. That means a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's very powerful. I mean, it very much is a very spiritual journey. It, 
brings up a lot of emotions for people of all ethnicities and cultures because it's it's obviously a, a, a public uh, activity, and I think it's it's also jarring for some, for people who are have not been ever confronted by the the painful parts or the the, the legacy of colonialism that is often very much suppressed here in not only the Netherlands but but Europe, and um, it gives the artist an opportunity to take these complicated uh, histories, difficult uh, stories, and using critical fabulation, for some of you might be familiar with uh, the way of uh, Saida Hartman's has uh, used that to imagine a conversation between uh, two enslaved people or two freedom seekers, and what would they have said to one another or to, to us if they were speaking for, from their own voice. And it's a very powerful way of, of, of also rendering, I think, a, um, a reconciliation with the past, acknowledging, um, seeing without, for many people who just pass by a lot of these places and have no, no connection to them at all, and using products like, I don't know if you noticed, there was someone who was, she was dancing with sugar. Well, obviously one of the most important colonial products, right? And using other, other symbols to re reimagine how these products that we take for granted today, coffee, sugar, tea, um, really were a very important part of this uh, historical memory. So thank you for, for sharing it. Wow, thank you. That's really powerful work. And just a question, do you always work with professional artists or um, my sense is you also work with students? You work with- Absolutely not. Yeah, so we, it's a very much a collaboration. We, we always work with a theater school. So we have students that are, that are uh, joining. It's all voluntary, of course that uh, volunteer that are part of their studies so they, they can get credits for doing this. We also work with professional dancers. Um, and also at this time, because we're collaborating with um, dancers and artists in, in Cape Town. So it's, a, it's very much a joint project. And so some of the students also get to write material as a way of also practicing their craft. So we, we try to make the space it also is very much an educational space. Everyone gets a copy of one of, of the book that's being used. So this is just a shameful plug. Excuse me, Lewis, I know you said you don't do this, but I'm gonna show a picture. So this is one of the, the books that we're focusing on this year because it's the whole country. So they always get a history tour so they can understand the historical context. So absolutely collaboration with professionals and, and students. So the students come in to do a performance and end up getting this amazing, wonderful education. Always. Thank you, Jennifer. Always. I know we're going to come back to you. I can see questions already starting. Um, and so we'll come to the questions and the comments. But let me go to Wandia, because I know, Wandia, I'm sure you've got thoughts on that. But also now as we come into this space, um, I'm hoping you'll take us into the classroom, but then also do your thing, which is to say the classroom is not big enough to contain us. Yeah, um, let me start by telling everyone happy Africa Day. I forgot to say that. Um, just reflecting on what Jennifer has been saying, um, I'm a person who loves color. So that's what pulled me to, to, the, to the clip that we saw. And what she's doing is what um, I envision education to be. Um, we are all, the, the panelists here do education differently. So she's doing tours, she's using space. Um, I use uh, digital media, Louis does all of, you know, travel, music uh, and the classroom. So I think that's basically a Pan-African idea of, of education that we want to educate through different media and different spaces. And uh, part of, I think the Pan-African project would be to, to remove the barriers that are currently confining us, especially in Kenya, uh, so that our education is broader than just what we do in the classroom. Um, I was telling Mshai, I think Louis was also there, uh, I think last week that I've also used food in, in my classroom when I was doing a, a Francophone African class we got the students to, to cook. The students would do some research on different uh, cuisine. And then we would come, come with our dishes prepared and come and tell the stories of what it was like to prepare those dishes and what we discovered about those dishes and, and the countries they are from. So, you know, um, 
my my wish, and I think what a Pan African education would do is to remove the barriers and involve all the senses, all time. Since Jennifer is talking about time travel, you know, using the the past, the present, the future, all senses, all spaces, so that. Uh, we are not confined to just small spaces where we can learn about ourselves. I, th I think, uh, and, and the vibe that I'm getting from our discussion here is that uh, we, we are expanding the spaces, all of us in our own little ways uh, so that education is not limited to, to schools. Um, I just wanted to say something about Kenya, although I know we are talking about Pan-Africanism, but um, the reason why I wanted to talk about it is because Kenya was also a settler colony and I feel that we have uh, not uh, really grappled with what it meant in the way that you see in uh, South Africa, for example, or Zimbabwe. And so our education is really, really restricted. Um, and we are restricted to, to, of course, the walls of the classroom, to a lot of regulation, and a lot of these regulations are brought direct for us to implement from, from the West. Um, so, you know, just even by our conversation here where we are breaking boundaries, where we have some in Europe, some in the Americas and some in Africa, I think that's what our education should represent, that we go beyond uh, the, the boundaries that have been set for us, not just the boundaries of the of of the nations, but the boundaries of the sea. Well, the sea is not a boundary; it facilitates communication. But just these artificial boundaries that keep us apart. I think Pan African education must be a commitment to, to transcend those boundaries, um, and then also now to transcend the boundaries on our souls, because that's a really big uh, issue that I have confronted. Um, for example, the idea that you go to school to get a job, it means that all other purposes of education, um, like being part of community, uh, thinking politically, I think Louis mentioned that, um, I think those are barriers that need to come down so that we give people the space to learn about the rest of the continent and, and the rest of the our people, but most of all, our humanity, because um, the fact that we are here as human beings means the world is our home. And we must, I feel that we must transcend the boundaries that have been placed on us historically so that uh, for, for us to have a Pan-African education. You need to unmute, Shai. Yeah, thank you very much. Wendy, I'm thinking about the word that you said, which is soul. And we don't normally talk about the soul in the classroom. Um, how, how as teachers who are working on a set curriculum where the exams are ahead of us, where you know, I have to report to parents, to school boards, to a range of different things, how do I find, how do I make the space? for this kind of thing, especially where some of these things, and you know, Jennifer's just taken us through, um, you know, just reminded us that we all work in so many different spaces. How do I find this space? And I know, I'm Louis, I'm gonna look at you also, because I know as I come to you as a philosopher, um, I know you think about some of these things because I, I know your work, but one dear, so just, just take me to how do I do this? As I know you work in the classroom as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I'll, I'll refer back to Lewis's book on uh, disciplinary decadence, where he talks of suspension of boundaries. Um, I think we have to be willing to transcend the boundaries that have been placed on us. Um, and that, that is very difficult when you have so many conflicting, because that's at least from the Kenyan experience, all these what they call stakeholders, which is a word I don't like, all these interests, I would call them interests that are competing for what happens in the classroom introduce these boundaries. And so students feel tired, you know, they don't know where to turn because they want, uh, their soul is speaking to them something, 
the boundaries that have been placed on them by the economy, the academy, the certificates, they kind of confine them and, and that leaves especially young people in confusion. So um, I think people have to be willing to transcend the boundaries. And I would call that a political decision. It's not a decision you would make alone in the classroom. You have to make it conscious that there are interests that you will be co competing against, that there are people who are going to get upset, but that's a political decision that, that you have to make. And um, when, when, you're, when you're embedded in the Pan-African project, the idea that the world is home and that all our people, all, all people are our people, then you have a confidence to transcend those boundaries, but on the other hand, it's a struggle and you, you, one has to be ready for the pushback. Mm. So it's personal work that you're doing for yourself and then creating it for other people who are your students. I know mm -hmm. we're gonna come back to this discussion as we go in, but Lewis, why don't you share your opening thoughts with us? Okay. Well, first I'd like to say Hotep, which is from the ancient African language of Meduneta spoken by the people of Kemet, which uh, whom you know today is Egyptians or the people of Egypt. We already know about the effort to take Egypt out of Africa, but a lot of people don't realize that that's recent and imperial. Ujambo again, Misawa for my Luo folks, Wimwega for my Kokoyo folks, Mulwene for my Koza folks in South Africa, and Sawaboda for the Zulu. And there are many we can keep going, as we know. There are many ways in which we speak and say hello. Uh, when we talked about ancestors in sacred space, I should let some many of you know. Is I'm born in Jamaica, but I'm I've been I was lucky because um, my family weren't didn't hide who we were. They weren't secrets in that sense. So I'm one of those few people from this part of the world who actually always knew my ancestry and knew the many rivers, as Langston Hughes would say, from which we flowed. And among them uh, is Ethiopia and Liberia. Now, the reason I uh, know that is because my great grandfather, whom I love dearly, uh, lived to be 110. And I used to always sit in his lap as a child and my grandmother as well, who knew, and both of them knew their great grandparents. And so to give you an idea, that's one of the reasons that knowledge continued. And in fact, it's very funny because my daughter went and took one of these genetics tests to prove me wrong. And boy, was she upset because everything I told her about her family ancestry was, uh, uh, was supported by that. But one of the things I'd like to say about a sacred space when I talked about the ancestors is that a sacred space creates accountability. You see, when we make treat the ancestors as living, and those to come as those for whom we're responsible. The sacredness is in our accountability and our accountability is connected to truth. And I bring this up mainly because this is connected to something that also uh, Jennifer brought up. You know, it's funny, when I teach African philosophy or when I teach in Africana studies or in black studies, there are people who are always questioning why we do this and there are some people who are critical because they say, in fact, I was in a debate once with a black conservative who said we shouldn't have these areas of studies because he claimed it makes people angry. And I said, what's wrong with that? They are healthy forms of anger. But as I debated him, it led to something that my wife Jane and I thought about, and we call it the pedagogical imperative. And you see, the reason the students got angry was not simply about learning the truth about the violence in history, but they also got angry for another reason. They got angry because they realized something that Jennifer brought up, which is that the people who are teaching them were illiterate. And what I mean by that is you have an obligation as a teacher to keep learning. So it's not an excuse as a teacher simply to say, well, especially if it's in say philosophy, as I'm just giving that as an example, there are many disciplines, for a philosopher to say, well, that's just not my expertise. 
the fact of the matter is even within your expertise, are you really going to say that black women and men didn't think? So the misrepresentate, what makes the students angry is that when they take a course, say a course like when I teach African philosophy, and they find out not only were all these African philosophers out there, but they also realized that there were questions not being asked when they looked at exclusively white philosophers. If you're in literature, if you only look at white literary people, if you're in history, you look at white historians, etc. There are questions that they are not asking. And in not asking those questions, they treat the rest of humanity and humanity's experience as irrelevant. So in effect, why the students are angry is because they actually want an education. Okay, so if we start from that insight, that a real education involves ongoing education, then this is what we call the pedagogical imperative, the imperative that in teaching, you are also learning. I bring this up also because we need to get rid of certain ways we think about teachers and students. I never call myself, uh, uh, I mean, there's a title professor, but I call myself a student, a lifelong student, because a professor for me is someone who fell in love with learning and continued to learn. And the reason this is crucial is because you see, we've inherited a colonial concept we call a university, but the university proper is something organized for the administration and the functioning of colonial regimes. And it's, it goes back to Bologna, Italy. But humanity has, has been learning for more than 100,000 years. And in fact, our hominin, right? Our, our species wouldn't have exist if it didn't have learners because we're a very vulnerable species. But this means that what I prefer to use is the word learning communities, communities of higher learning, whichever way you may want to call it, because learning communities mean you learn from each other. Students, for instance, although they may be beginning learners, are coming to it with experiences that an advanced learner could learn from, just as a beginning learner could learn from the experiences of an advanced learner. So it's a form of humility. But it's also important to understand these because, you know, there's something that many people fail to understand because we've inherited colonial regimes of learning. You know, the earliest scientists, the earliest mathematicians were women. But we've inherited this view of looking at thinking people as exclusively male. And in fact, the language I opened up with, Meruneta, had a term for scientific knowledge, right? It was called reke. And the people who did it were called a reke. But you know, the reke were female. And if you think about it, there's a logical reason why in many ancient societies, the earliest manifestations of what we call scientists were female. And the simple straightforward reason for this is, is something that most women know, and especially those who are mothers, which is you can't get through that without powers of observation. <laughs> observation is the key element of all scientific inquiry. And in fact, and as you know, down to female health, all kinds of things, cycles, mathematics, et cetera. So now, now this of course is not to romanticize the female body or women, but it's for us to understand that communities, right, are more complex in their ways of learning. And why should we be ignoring more than 150,000 years of learning that took place in the African continent? So I'll start with that. The second thing to add to it is some of the things that many of us don't realize is that Africa is an African word. The same language I began in Meduneta, all the word Africa means is if it's a root, it's a lot of foundations from the word ka. And ka refers to life and the womb. Africa simply means from the womb, from the source, from the life. And there's a lot of research on this. If you look at the writings of Gerald Massey, you'll see this. But you could also see it in uh, Charles Finch, many others, okay? But I just want the many of the, the listeners and the viewers to know, and, and, and this is not to say if it weren't an African word, it would be somehow less, but it's very important to know it was an African word precisely because it's important to know that we humanity didn't start thinking from the Greek, the Latin and the English language. 
that humanity taught science, ideas, etc., from many languages, and the earliest languages were African ones. The other thing I want to say, because Africa Day is connected to Pan-Africanism, is that ultimately Pan-Africanism is about global democracy. Because you see, colonialism was about disempowering people. And it was about part of that disempowerment is to try to erase from our memory the many gifts that we are able to bring as thinking people. When you think of an enslaved African, don't think of brute labor. Don't think of people as the stereotype goes, walking in the bush. Those people who were kidnapped from the continent of Africa were skilled labor. And they brought their knowledge across the world, which is why so much of the world at the level of technology, science was, and science were able to, was able to flourish, okay? Now, again, it's, it's very short. So I'll just, just tell three short stories and we could continue. Uh, when we think about this question about democracy, you see, if you're talking about empowering people and you're getting rid of disempowerment, colonialism, is a form of disempowerment. And this means that if we're thinking about Africa, if we're thinking about it today, the 21st century project is going to be about getting rid of the privatization of power, which is what colonialism is about. And think about the emancipation of power as a public good, which means it belongs to all. Now, if we think in terms of Africa, the story I want to think to bring up first is a story of Franz Boas and W.B. Du Bois, the famous African American scholar who, who, whose remains, who left the United States and is now and was laid to rest in Ghana. Du Bois, at one time, really believed the colonial crap that somehow uh, Europeans were civilizing Africans, and he had invited Franz Boas, who was a German Jewish anthropologist and physicist to speak, who wrote against race and racism, to speak at Atlanta University. And he wanted him to speak on race. And Boa said, I don't wanna speak on race because, you know, black students are smart. They already know how to read my writings on race. I wanna talk, talk about African history. And when he said that, the boy said, what? He said, yeah, African history. He said, you know, you know, Europe, Europe on the world stage has been very recent. It's only a few hundred years. Most of humanity's history is in Africa, which means most of the great revolutions that enabled our species to survive took place in Africa. And as he went through that and he went and spoke and he said, think of the violence done to those black students or to any African students through convincing them that they have no history and that they were not agents of history. And this is, an, and this is what led Du Bois to begin to rethink Africa in world history and the boys to think the Encyclopedia Africana. So when we're thinking about Pan-Africanism, although we tend to think about the political question of African states, we also need to think about the knowledge question. And the knowledge question, right? Pan-Africanism is in Africana, right? Africana philosophy, Africana thought, African diaspora, but that ultimately is part of Africa Day. Africa Day is really the world history. And for those of you, many of you who are thinking about these questions, if we, if we rethink this, we need to think beyond the commodification of the colonial university as the custodian of knowledge. What Jennifer is doing is the production of knowledge. What you are doing right now, uh, Maishai and Wandia, that is knowledge. What people are doing right now, this part of this global mechanism knowledge, knowledge belongs to the world. We need to liberate knowledge. And that liberation of knowledge, okay? This means that we now need to be creative. And part of our project for the 21st century is to build alternative learning communities. Learning communities that are addressing 21st century problems. Because right now, trying to resolve problems in the 21st century by looking to the 19th, 18th and 17th century would be to reinforce the, 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 the uh, knowledge and normative frameworks of what put us into this crap in the first place. We need to offer something better for humanity. And just to conclude, one thing to begin with, I highly recommend, I highly recommend for, for many, uh, and I'll put a link to it, 
Uh, although it's philosophy, and I have to say for full disclosure, I'm not a philosophy nationalist. For me, philosophy is just among other organizations of knowledge. I always remind my colleagues, there are more important, philosophy is important, but there are more important questions than simply philosophy to look at. But philosophy is a start. However, there is a text done by one of the greatest living African philosophers, a man I love dearly, by the name of Kwasi Wirudu from, Gua, from Ghana. He compiled a collection of writings under the title, A Companion to African Philosophy. And here's why I recommend looking it through this book. Because although it's a whole, it's a lot of people talking about philosophy, the thing is African philosophy has never fetishized philosophy. It's always been looking at philosophy as a context for something greater. And through that text, you'd learn about the record. You'd learn about the history of African women in philosophy. You would learn about the history of science thought. You would learn about the trade routes. You would learn about the understanding concepts down to how you think of God. So the thing about it is, even though the word philosophy in the title, it's a start, because through that you would learn a lot about not about what we would call the canon that you you asked about. Okay, we don't need to have colonial canonicity. We can now decolonize canon, canonicity, and try to understand that any moment at which you're homogeneous, if you begin to find you're only reading men, if you begin to find you're only reading people who are in the English language, if you find you're only reading about people who were, were Eurocentric, you have a problem. And what's beautiful about this book is that it announces itself with humility as a start. And from there, you can go and find many opportunities to build from there. And what you'd learn, like that example I used of being a student, you can find to learn together. Sorry, you still. <laughs> it burns so beautifully, full circle, because what I think all of you are saying, and this is so important, and this is why we said um, for Africa Day, which is when we talk about liberation and freedom, it really begins with this thing of nurturing yourself. I love that idea of car and the womb and birthing the new self, yourself, and then looking at everybody else, how we nurture ourselves to do the work as human beings. And then you took us right back to where Jennifer started us with, you know, talking about looking at yourself and saying, what am I missing? What's not quite complete with this picture? And how do I push forward beyond, you know, past everything that people have said, we can't, we can't, we can't, you're not enough, you know, your heritage has got nothing. And to say, hang on a second, let me uncover this truth. So I think there's a lot of beauty in what all of you have said. I've got so many questions. I know there are questions that are coming up already, but I just wondered if any one of you wanted to say anything to the other, something that somebody said, and you're like, hold on, I just have to say that to you before um, we proceed. Jennifer, anything that Wandia and Lewis said? Well, actually, Lewis sent me a, a message that I, I really wanted to make sure I understood because he, he, he provided, and Lewis, you, you, you were making a comment about um, the idea of, of, I th think you were talking about the Castle of Good Hope when you saw the video. Could you by chance uh, clarify what you meant in your comment? Sure. What, what, well, one of the things that's when we begin to educate ourselves is one of the problems is that what we have inherited from um, colonialism is a kind of tunnel vision. And part of educating ourselves is to break down those walls. And it means we have to learn how also how to read the language that's all around us, but we often fail to see. It happens not only in the arts, but in, in a variety of other areas. And we need uh, to learn how to reread myths. So you may notice when I looked at that clip, I could reread many myths. And among them, it was in the fort, right? It, it, right? Mm -hmm. And colonialism wants us to think as is as if we're in a cell right even its notion of the self is in a cell right and we take, think even language is thought of as if it's a in a container or a cell so you have the folks in there 
But, you know, ancient African and also ancient Asian, many societies, and in fact, most even ancient European, many modes of thought was not actually about humanity in a cell, but actually humanity as actually producing through motion, which you have in dance, that which actually puts the cell or the vase, we carry it, you see? Mm. So, so, the, so because that's a dance of freedom, it raised a very interesting question because above you was the sky, but beneath you, of course, were stones. It wasn't the actual dirt earth. And of course the viewer is a question mark because if it's closed on all sides, the viewer also is in the fort. But if the viewer is beyond the fort, which is the possibility you're asking, then it's a, a, a display of freedom. But here's the thing I'd like to add for, the, for, for folks about myth. You see, sometimes people bring things to myth that's pernicious. And what I mean by this is, if you think of ancient, very ancient African myths, you know, in a, myth, a lot of many ancient African myths, and if I pick, for instance, Kemet as an example, you know, the sky was female, Newt, and the earth was male, Geb. And what's interesting in that myth of the creation of gods is that the female mounts the male. She's on top. Well, the, Europe, the, the, the Mediterranean North, the, the, the Greek-speaking people and Roman-speaking people adopted that myth, but they could not tolerate the idea of a woman on top. So they turned it upside down and made the sky masculine and the earth feminine. But the, the hint of the names are there because Nut was pronounced Un, so you have Uranus up and Geb became Gaia. Now you see that subversion? And so, mm -hmm. but this is crucial here, you see, because in a way, when we think about this, the, 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 the femininity of the sky, if you're reasserting African origins and also water, which reflects the sky, means that there's now a moment in which they could be generative. And so the dance, if we rethink it in a productive mythic way, is also supposed to be fecund. It's supposed to make things flourish or grow. So even though there's this torture, the sorrow of the fort, the world of art there is to bring us in touch with the myths through which we can now liberate ourselves with the proper practices. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What a beautiful way of, of seeing it and interpreting what you saw for it. Thank, that, I, I have nothing else to say. <laughs> that, leaves, that renders me. Such a deep interpretation and I'm also falling and thinking through it and thinking, wow, that really does make sense. One of the most challenging things to do is oftentimes to put words to what we do because so much of what we do is guided by a very strong spiritual force and oftentimes, and the creative process um, in not only the tours that I, that I conduct, but also specifically in the sites of memory work um, is a spiritual process. And the, the collaboration with artists, spoken, you know, poets, dancers, um, historians, bringing all of these, this mind space together is 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 subversive as you as you you said in, in one point it's disruptive but it's also dismantling we are constantly chipping away our, at ourselves at the colonization of ourselves and what i love about the inter, the transnationalism about it is language is also disrupted so we often just take so much for granted when we just the things that we say have an origin in this very colonized frame. And we're challenged by each other because we all have, for example, artists in Cape Town who, when we're talking about Cape Town's history from this European gaze, will say to us, that is a very colonized way of, of saying this. That is not authentic. That is not our language. Here's how we would say it in our own language. And you don't have to speak uh, uh, to understand it. 
Mm -hmm. because there is a universality in communicating from the soul that you just can't get by reading it in a book. Mm -hmm. So the movement, the words, the, the music using traditional instruments is a way of also re-educating ourselves that we don't need to rely on the university, which is singular for a reason, because it's supposed to teach you to think in one particular way, that the classroom, we create the classroom and that this is knowledge that, that also this white gaze has forgotten. We don't think about that colonization, what it did, and I love, I'm thinking now, right now, I'm channeling uh, Toni Morrison about what racism, what slavery did to the, it broke us, humanity, right? It turned people into owners and others into objects and we can't fix this unless we really confront that issue. So I think the work that we're all doing, I'm just so deeply moved by it. I, I feel very honored to be a part of that conversation and that I allow myself to be an access point where the spirits that, that say, we need you to say this. And literally without being too you know woo woo about it, when I'm doing the tours, when I'm doing, I am being guided what to say. Oftentimes like, where the heck did that come from? I, these aren't my words. This is as if this is being, you're being called upon to reimagine this is what it should have been. This is what you should have said. This is where they should have looked to get the message from this archive in the building or in the canal water or in the sea. And is returning to that place of rememory uh, re that because it's like as if we've been we've been anesthetized, drugged by colonization for centuries, and we forgot how to feel, we forgot how to listen, we forgot how to see. Um, we for, it's it's like the matrix, right? Coming out of the matrix, and really being embodying these spaces that we have occupied always. It's not about this is Europe and it belongs to one group. We've been travelers throughout time. And I loved what you said, uh, Lewis, about the idea that it was not, they did not capture people who had no knowledge. I, one of the words, for example, I just abhor is the idea that planters. So you talk about colonialism and these planters, you know, that that's had the plantation, they didn't plant anything. They did not have the knowledge of how to to uh, irrigate land, how to um, cultivate crops. That's what why they captured specifically certain groups in Africa because they came with that knowledge. And we're saying, don't take that for granted. We have to teach ourselves about our own power. That's part of what's missing in education is that the children that I encounter who on my tours will just start weeping because they're not expecting to hear their stories amplified and their agency to give them power back to them that they always had, but just forgot. So. <sighs> I love that thought of education as disruption. And one day I want you to just um, come in here, but there's also a question from Franklin Murian Murianaki, Murianki who says um, he's a lecturer, he works for the UN, is also a lecturer at Riara University. And his question is, why are we still having, studying, teaching Western narratives of faculty? Why aren't we having our own Afrocentric syllabuses in our schools? I think we've already began having that discussion. So I wondered if you wanted to share your thoughts and also answer that question while we go. Okay, I, I think I'll go back to what Lewis was saying about truth. The reason why the syllabus is organized the way it is in Kenya is so that we don't learn the truth. And the truth is not limited to Afrocentric curriculum. It's also about Europe as Jennifer is saying, and even Lewis has said that. Uh, the, we don't even tell the stories of Europe, by the way. I, I, I studied French and I teach French and a lot I went, the few times I've been able to teach French culture and history, so many things that I say the students have never heard of them. So our curriculum does not teach anything. I'm sorry to say, I, I know I, I'm not exaggerating. 
What it does is that it teaches concepts and then makes the students abstract them so much that they can't apply them to daily life. They can't visualize real people and real places and real time. So sometimes even when you're teaching a part of European history and you actually show the space and the time and the people who are involved in, in that particular event, it shocks students because for them, what they're learning is abstracted from life and from experience. So for the, what I have discovered as I have taught in Kenya is that we don't teach anything. We don't teach history of anybody. I mean, I would almost wish we would even teach uh, Europeans properly, you know, but we don't teach anybody because what we teach is, is students to abstract and detach whatever they're learning from real people, place, and time. So that's where the problem is for us. It's, it's not really the cultural origins of whatever we are teaching. It's that whatever we are teaching is not attached to real people. We mm -hmm. learn to become civil servants to serve in the government. And if you check the history, and this is why I'm saying I wish we were even teaching European history, because if you check the history of, of uh, the colonial administration, that's how they were taught. They, in fact, they were told, which really surprised me. Colonial officers were told that they must not get attached to the place where they are sent. And um, I think it was Lord Cromer who wrote the sort of like the handbook for colonial administration. He even said that uh, the least effective colonial officers are the ones who have been in a colony for a certain time because they start to get biased and they start to see the colonized as human beings. And they can't have that because those colonial officers will interfere with the imperial project. So we have to learn world history. We have to learn human history. Wherever people are, we have to learn that history. And what Africana knowledge brings is truth, which is what Lewis is saying. It brings a truthful perspective to whatever you're learning. So whether you're learning about Kant or Kierkegaard or about Du Bois and Kwame Nkrumah, what the Africana perspective brings is truth. And that's what is being fought against in the curriculum. We are not being allowed to speak truth about whatever we want to talk about. Well, speaking of truth, Obio Biroviambo asks, he says, well, these are difficult times for Pan-Africanists because there's also the struggle to seize the African space on the global trade. How do we ensure that Pan-Africanism is not apologist for failure of post-colonial leader, African leaders um, of sounding like nostalgic hankering for what was? Um, this is directed specifically to you, Andia, but anybody else also feel free to join in as well. How can our liberative education create a pushback of globalization, especially in the recolonization by technology? I'm opening that out. Can I defer that to Luis? <laughs> Luis. <laughs> well, for, there, there, there are many things. For starts, hmm. get rid of imitation. Mm. Get rid of imitation. This is one of the things Fanon argued about in La Dame de la Terre, The Damned of the Earth. But it's, but it's not only Fanon, Cabral, many others have argued this. What, and what did he mean? Well, if you look at the point of independence, right? All, not only uh, across Africa, but the Caribbean and parts of Asia, the, 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 um, the people who fought for the independence they ended, they fought primarily to change the players, but not the game, mm -hmm. right? In other words, they just wanted to take the place of the colonizers, but they didn't want to change the colonial system. And we know this because you see at first when independence happens, the people are celebratory. Okay, they dance in the streets and they begin to put on the clothes they prefer to wear they, they begin to want to be part of the world. So as you know, everywhere you go in the world, as an example, people have their version of pizza. Everywhere you go in the world, they have their version of jazz, hip hop, whatever it may be, 
right? That's culturally, that's fine. But I mean, this is the crucial part. But what? But what do they do with institutions of power? Now, what are institutions of power? Well, institutions of power are education, economy, religion, um, um, the the uh, legal systems, the the organizing of political life, and. And this one is really crucial. A lot of people don't pay attention to it, but Fanon did. Architecture. Okay. Now, what 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 do we see happen? Well, they say we're liberated, we're going to be free, we're going to be post-colonial, but they keep the same education system. All those things stay intact. And the reason they stay intact is because many of the people foolishly imagine those things were independent of the colonial system, mm -hmm. when in fact they were organically linked to the colonial system. Interwoven, yes. So if you start, we already started with education because if you stop thinking university and think learning communities, it opens up the possibility to learn from different kinds of learners, okay? But similarly, if we go to the last one I mentioned, architecture, what in the world are we doing with having European style buildings all across Africa, where the whole point of European style buildings is to retain heat, not get rid of it. Makes no sense in tropical environments. Why do we think immediately, a and Fanon brought this up, a capital city in terms of high rises and urbanization, when, when in fact all a city is, is a place of citizenship. Citizenship could be spread out. It could work, at, right? Why don't we think, and if you spread it out, you could have geothermal energy, which is far more efficient to use in the global South, okay? Why are we in the world do we have in Kenya or in other parts of Africa, people walking into courtrooms with white powdered wigs and robes? That, that's nonsense. So the thing what, what we have to begin to ask, and then why, when we come to the question of economies, are we still dealing with the fetishizing of the capitalist conception of an economy. We're in a false dilemma when we think capitalism or socialism as if it's, those are the only two ways of thinking. But the fact of the matter is, this leads us to a situation where we could only think about a dichotomy of absolutely hoarded privatization, right? And which blocks the public. But the fact of the matter is what we have to start with is to understand that this conversation we're having today is in a radically different world than the ideas that produce the kind of capitalism that's imposed upon us. Mm -hmm. And what do I mean by this? That, that world imagined our planet as endless. That world imagined our planet as having, you know, ongoing resources. We live in a world of 8 billion people with technologies that enable us right now, all of us right now are spread out across the globe yet simultaneously in communication. Mm -hmm. You know what happens when you could reach another human being almost instantaneously and you have more people, which means space has shrunk. It means we, we today, live on a smaller planet. And that means we need to use our creativity to understand how to organize life and think life in a way that's suitable for people on a smaller planet. And this means that we're so interconnected that if we're going to think about, this is not about nostalgia, right? When we say Pan-Africanism, because we're not trying to say, how do we imitate the Pan-Africanist of the past? We need to look at the Pan-Africanist of the past as setting the conditions for us to have a, con a conversation about Pan-Africanism today. And the reason this is important is because you see, it's not only Pan-Africanists, but all of our ancestors, as we rethink them, right? As the conversation showed as skill labor, thinking labor, but we also have to understand that our ancestors never stopped fighting. 
We know this because we are here today. Yeah. Because the people who colonized them were actually imagining a future without us. For right, one of the wet dreams of capitalism is profit without human beings. And so right now, we need to think, we, I'm not talking about all of us, we have the obligation, if we have taken on this commitment for the future, for descendants, for life on our planet, to use our creativity, but it means for us to look at the truth that we live on a very different planet mm -hmm. from those who organized those systems of knowledge that preceded us. It is our task to build creatively new systems of knowledge that will fit the humanity to come. Because we all know this, it's an old cliche, but it's a truthful one. There's no such thing as one shoe size that fits all. We need to start building and creating different ways of movement, of understanding how to live our humanity. Wow. So I am, we're coming to the end of this, but I do have two. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I know it's such great conversation. <laughs> but I do have two questions. Jennifer, Martin Jeroge is the same. Jennifer, I love the view that we need to confront the negative effects of and the grip that slavery and colonialism have had and continue to have on Africa. But as Fernand says, there are many of us Africans who behave and act more white and colonizers than the colonizers themselves. We see it even in the attitudes that many of us continue to have towards the accents of English that we use. The more one speaks like the Briton, the more, and we could say this of the French, the Dutch, whoever, the more one tends to be placed on the prestige ladder. How do we deal with these hangups? How do we continue raising awareness that Africa and being African or of African descent or heritage is beautiful? and that we are not in any way inferior. And this is Martin Jeroge from USIU Africa. And I want to add to that because I know you work constantly with students who maybe are coming to this for the first time after being told all these things about who they are not. Um, so yeah, how do we do this? Well, that's a, that's a big question. And it immediately for me, I remember when I first started even conceptualizing of doing the tours and the work that I'm now deeply immersed in and even as something as simple as naming mm. when i was you know interviewing my family who have been in the netherlands now for almost three four generations my mother grew up here in, in amsterdam after world war ii she was a student teacher she she earned um two master's degrees studying here and so i really felt a deep connection to the land here and I was thinking, okay, what am I going to name this tour? Because if it's going to be a public, you know, something that's accessed by the public, I wanted to have agency and blah, blah, blah. And so I was first was going to be African heritage. Then I thought about, well, it's not only about but black empowerment. So I'll call it black heritage. And both terms within, I know that my family's probably hate, if there any of them are watching, hate that they ever thought this way rejected the idea, you can't call it black heritage, you can't call it African heritage because we're not black. Now, I grew up as a, a child of the 70s in the US, you know, coming out of the, the civil rights movement and, and, and very much aware of black consciousness and identity. So I was totally confused by this. What do you mean we're not black? Well, you're not black, you're, you're I mean, I'm, we're the same, complexion, we, we, we come from the same history. And there was such a rejection of black identity among the diaspora of people that I was in direct contact with that it broke my heart. Because we felt, fell for that, that lie that to be black, to be African meant that you were inferior naturally, that you could not have reached a certain level of, of power economically or assimilation, whatever. And it just really made me become keenly aware of how the, the, who owns the past, right? The production of knowledge that has been so entrenched in, in making people of the diaspora believe that they are not 
who we really are. And it really does take going to the continent and visiting the land in which our ancestors came from to become much more aware of, of how much that, that lie influences us. And I think these kinds of forums, creating spaces, infiltrating spaces that have been seized or claimed as, again, like, you know, this belongs to Europe. Whoever said it, that Europe doesn't even know its own history. <laughs> so I think that producing knowledge in very different ways as, as Lewis so beautifully and, and, and all the panelists have so beautifully articulated is essential. And one of the things I often, one of the central questions I often ask is if it doesn't exist where you are, then you must create it. That is the call for you to create something that does not exist. If it's wrong, then you must correct it. And if, if you're sometimes the only single voice because no one told everyone in my family said, you can't do this. You're gonna get us kicked out of the country. Oh, First of all, we're not black. So that's, that's off the table. And who's gonna pay you to do a tour like this? And Dutch people are not gonna allow you to say these things about their history. Listen to how I'm framing this. So first we have to claim the space, reclaim it, you know, to feel that we have, are entitled and have the right to tell our own stories in our own way. And if, if there's an audience of one, then that's all you need to start. Think about all the great revolutions that began, began with one person objecting to the system. So I tell uh, whoever asked the question that if you're asking about something that you're trying, you're, you're confronting in your own place where you live and you're trying to create something, do it. And you would be surprised, especially with social media today, that there are many people that are thinking like you and also asking the same question. So don't wait for the community to come. You start and the community will follow. That is, that is how I have dealt with what I'm doing because I came from a completely different background. I'm really late to, be, to this academic space, really late in my mind late, like, if I had thought of this 20 years ago, but you know how much further I, I think to myself I would have been, but I'm here at the time when I'm supposed to be here. So it's never too early, it's never too late. I tell people all the time, if you're, because if you're, I get asked all the time, how did you do it? I say, I just did it. I had no money, <laughs> I had no plan, but I had this deep inner spiritual driving me that I had to keep going. I didn't know where it was gonna lead me to be quite honest. I had a background in marketing, completely different than what I'm doing today. But I used that skill set. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a natural like, oh, I'll go from marketing to being a historian. I mean, there, there are two separate things, but yet in many ways I use all of those skills. So I, I think there's so much that we can produce as a, as a body of people that we just need to stop being afraid to do it. I hope yeah, I answered yeah. that. Well said. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, to that I'd like. I just want to just add uh, uh, one, uh, uh, just a brief thing, which is, is to echo that point, which is, we have a tendency in our times to want to have the outcome before the performance. There's no such thing as outcome without performance. Mm. You find out through doing. Absolutely, and being fearless. Sometimes just you will be laughed at. People will you know make fun of you, and that's when you know you're on the right track because they only tackle the one that's carrying a ball. So don't worry about the, you know, people discouraged because they're usually the ones that are afraid to do it themselves. I really like that thought. And, you know, I'm thinking about these threads, disruption, courage, um, liberation, truth, and every, each one of you embodies those words. Each one of you knows what it's like to go into the unknown where nobody else has gone and to say things that other people will challenge you on it. I could continue talking to you. And we've got to do one. We've got to find a way of having this conversation continue. I really have to bring this to a close. I want to ask each of you to just give us a final thought of thoughts to end with and in doing so, if you could speak, there's a question that was put in quite early and I wanted to keep it for the end. Habil Ondiek said, asked us, why do we celebrate Africa today? 
Why not yesterday? Why not tomorrow? Why are we saying it's important to celebrate Africa and liberation and courage and disruption and everything we're talking about today? So as you give us your final comments, send us out with that answer. Anybody who wants to go first? And then I promise everybody a treat at the end of this. Well, I would just like to say that that's a myth. That is a myth. We have, see, and I, this is something I'm often having to say also in my own work. It's not something that just started with the killing of George Floyd, right? These movements have been in existence for centuries. Now, of course we have, we're in a time where information travels much faster than it did a hundred years ago. But I reject the notion that we, we don't celebrate Africa every day. We do. And I think we have to be, be, be willing to accept that even though society has given it a label as a day or a month or whatever, that doesn't, that isn't, that's not, we're not held to those boundaries, mm. right? Mm. I, I celebrate Africa just by waking up in the morning, right? Looking to the sun. I have an altar where, where the things that, that connect me to my spiritual self, where I can relate to. That's celebrating Africa every day in me. So we also have to be careful that we don't retain some of that, that way of thinking that because it says this is the day, that that means that that's the only day anybody's doing anything about it. I don't think that's true. I think all of us here on this panel and those of you who join, because it's not just the day and that we want to, to, to be inspired by each other to continue doing the work that we do every day. So I think that's for me, um, how I respond to that is that I've been watching people who have been working on this project 20 years who finally are getting recognition for something that they did 20 years ago. And we have to remember the ancestors those who came before us that paved the way for us to have this moment. Thank you very much, Jennifer. I'm going to ask you for the final, final word. I'm gonna give that to you for a particular reason because- We're out of time. Thank you so much for taking us and reminding us Africa Day happens every single day if we choose to make it that way. Wandia, Lewis, who wants to go next? Let, let me go because um, there's something I'm gonna speak to which I, I, I think Luis will wrap up really well. Um, I just want to speak to a problem that I have noticed among Kenyan academics. Um, we focus on the sort of like the, the, the visible, the superficial man manifestations of cultural imperialism, like accents, but um, a, a few, weeks ago, a journalist called me and asked me, why is it that when Kenyan, uh, Kenyans join the media, their accent becomes more and more British? Is it that they have an inferiority complex? And we keep wow. going straight to that explanation and it doesn't work. And I told this journalist, the problem is the way the industry is constructed. Because if you join the media as a, 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 an anchor, you have a very short lifespan. And then where do you go next? The, the next uh, career progression is either you become a PR manager, you quit and start doing PR for farms, or you do like Larry Maddow and go to CNN or BBC. So in preparation for BBC, you have to improve or rather change your accent so that your what BBC will want and what CNN will want. So what we need to do is to change the structure of the industry and the structure of our journalism so that Kenyans who join the media industry can see themselves becoming the, uh, a senior journalist in their 50s and 60s, still reporting and not being pushed aside for an 18 year old who has just left the university. And this is what the Kenyan academics are not doing. They're not analyzing the structures of power, which is what Lewis was talking about. We are just focusing on accents, colors, you know, uh, do you eat githeri for dinner? Instead of asking, what is it about the education system that makes people do certain things? What is it about our theology that makes people think that Christianity means uh, this? 
what is it about our government, our industries that makes us do this and this? And those are questions of power. They're not questions of culture. They're questions of power. And the Kenyan Academy is so shy about asking the power questions. And so we focus on cultures and litanies of cultures and going back to the past and all that. And we never answer the questions about power. So I'm encouraging us to just let go of that shyness and start asking about the power structures within our laws, within our religion, within our, our culture, our education, because those are the questions which we as thinkers should be answering. And indeed- Oh, sorry, before, uh, let me just add, please uh, some uh, check my video on um, the, the pitfalls of indigenous knowledges where I talk about the Kenyan Academy especially and this tyranny of culture. And this is on the Maisha Kazini um, vlog and we've put, yes. we've put the link or you could just go okay. to YouTube and look for Maisha Kazini, M-A-I-S-H-A, K-A-Z-I-N-I, -I, and you'll be able to find that link. Indeed, um, Kerubo Abuya had put, thank you for the great conversation. Also on Godwin's list of institutions of power, add spirituality. A foreign embraced spirituality interpreted in ways outside of an African epistemology continues to be a seriously disorienting phenomenon for the African of the 21st century embedded across all the other institutions of power that have been outlined. So the question of power, of religion, of spirituality was something that she wanted to bring into the conversation. Thank you, Kerubo, for that comment. Lewis, for your final comment. Sure. Well, thank you all, not only uh, for the conversation we just had, but also the many viewers. Although you may not have been uh, speaking orally, you're part of this conversation. Mm -hmm. I would say, I would say right away, I'd like to say that this conversation itself is actually the critique of that question about say, why simply today? And what I mean by that is what we have just discussed over the past hour and a half is more than 150,000 years of African history. <laughs> we have also discussed the complexities of how we can look at it in terms of the richness demographically, linguistically. And although this is just touch, just touching a little bit on it, the, the point of the matter is we are able to have this conversation because we realize, and we made it very clear that there are many people who preceded us, many who are nameless, whose actions were the conditions of our possibility. You see, there are so many who are nameless, but without whom we could never be. And this is because they acted with humility and with commitment. We too will one day will be nameless, but the future mm -hmm. can only rest on our actions. And what this should make you all realize, or at least alert you to, is that the actions of everyone matters. But the thing is, nobody knows in advance the consequences, where they, what it will yield. So what are you left with if you do not have that knowledge in advance? What you're left with is the crucial question of your commitment. Fundamentally, the question that underlies all we're talking about is to what are you committed? And if we're committed, we, just as our ancestors, just as many of those who are nameless, would enable those to come to look back and say, thank God they acted. Wow, what a wonderful thought to carry with us. It, 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 it echoes, I can see Franklin Murianki has just reminded us of Fanon's quote, each generation must discover its mission, fulfill or betray it in the relative opacity. And so that, that thing that we each carry, you know, do it, do it now, because you may not be able to see the effect, but those who will come afterwards will be able to look back and hopefully thank each one of us for what we have done. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. If you look at the chat, we've got so many people saying thank you to each of our panelists. You've provoked us, you've challenged us, you've encouraged us, you've inspired us. 
in the words of Wangoi Wagoro, and thank you, Wangoi, because Wangoi was a previous panelist when we talked about um, language. So it's so wonderful to have her with us today. And she says, Asante ni sana, very thought provoking Walimu. And we've got many people. Um, I can see Dineke Stam is saying thank you for the beautiful conversation and inspiration and the encouragement to ask questions of power. Um, I want to thank the elephant Alliance Francaise and Ifra Nairobi for making this space possible. I want to thank everybody who's put a comment. I know we couldn't get to all the questions, but thank you for them. We will save the chat. We will look at the comments in YouTube and we will continue to use them to shape um, the conversations. We do not take it for granted that even though only a few of us have spoken in this space, as Lewis said so beautifully, your presence is felt, it's appreciated. And the things that we are learning from you, from your comments and your questions, we ask you to please share, come back to this conversation, think along with us. It will be on the um, Alliance Francaise de Nairobi's um, YouTube. Um, immediately after this, where it is being live streamed, it will also be put up on the archives of both on YouTube and on the Elephant site. And as we come to the end of the series, we are beginning to look at the end of the series. This is our eighth conversation. We will like, we will want to find a way of archiving all of this. So continue to talk, continue to comment, continue to ask us questions. We will be with you again in another a month's time when we will be talking about activism and we'll be looking at activism past, activism present and activism in the future. Atwell Kane says, thank you. This was an excellent conversation. Lewis remains a super thinker. And I think that is true of every one of us. Today, as we close, because it is a day that we remember that liberation comes out of disruption, out of freedom, out of telling truth, out of speaking out, out of having the courage to go into the spaces that we are given and to stand up. We will close with a poem from Jennifer Tosh. Wandia Lewis Jennifer, thank you, thank you, thank you. Jennifer, over to you. Thank you, thank you so much for this conversation. I'm so inspired. I'm actually reading a poem that uh, is adapted from, um, from Saida Hartman's Venus in Two Acts. It's in the Sites of Memory. And I think um, I really appreciate you allowing me to share it with you in closing. How do we tell impossible stories? Stories about women, children, and men bearing the names that deface and disfigure about the words exchanged between captives and freedom seekers that were never recorded in the archives. Their appeals, their prayers, their secrets never uttered because there was no one there to receive them. We intended to both tell these impossible stories and to amplify the impossibility of their telling. Our intention wasn't anything as miraculous as recovering the lives of the enslaved or redeeming the dead but rather to paint a full picture of the lives that have been held captive by history. The irreparable violence of slavery and colonialism lives precisely in the stories that we cannot know and that we will never be recovered. This is the afterlife, a past that is yet to be fulfilled and the ongoing state of emergency in which black and brown life remain in peril. So what do we do in the meantime? We must interrogate the production of knowledge, establish who we are in relation to who we have been, recruiting, recovering, retrieving, and reconciling the past for the sake of the living. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you.